Welcome to the Digital Amateur Television Experimenters Night. This is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania. Amateur radio is a worldwide hobby that has many different aspects. Digital television is just one of the many modes and areas that are covered. Maybe you're interested in becoming involved in the DATV Experimenters Nights. Do you realise that you do not have to be a radio amateur or need any ATV equipment to participate anywhere in the world? Also participate in the night by coming up to the Queen's Domain Club Rooms. Yes, right on top of the Queen's Domain in the Heritage Listed Coast Wireless Station. You never know, we might get you in front of the camera or behind doing one of the many roles during the night. We get underway with our program on a Wednesday night from 7.30pm local time. We'll see you soon. This is VK7 OTC. Okay, this is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania with our ATV Experimenters Nights. And I've got a very special guest uh, and new to the uh, ATV studio, Mr. Glenn Aldous. Good evening, Glenn. Good evening, Dustin. How'd you be? Good. Now, Glenn's come along, uh, came along last week um, and was impressed with the, the setup. And mentioned that he, um, he he one of his hobbies, one of his many hobbies, is um, and um, I, I heard you say sanity check, <laughs> is um, restoring AWA valve radios, and my ears pricked up. <laughs> and um, so Glenn's come along to actually show us and take us through his latest project. So yeah, across to you, Glenn. Okay, so yes, it was a sort of sanity thing, because uh, I'm studying, and uh, every now and then for a sanity break, uh, I've been, uh, for the last year or so, mucking around with some old radios that I've had in the garage, and uh, finally got them to the point where I thought, yeah, I really need to start working to fix some of these. So I've been on a big learning curve as far as valve technology is concerned, um, but I find it quite fascinating. Cool, cool, cool. And, and what sort of... What sort of led you to to valve radios? Like, <laughs> was it was it sort of you, you know you had a epiphany or? A <laughs> no, I just liked the I liked the look of the big old standard valve radios. Okay. Um, I picked up a couple in my days at uni and carted okay. them around with me, um, even though none of them worked. Okay. Uh, and so those were the first ones I actually got up and running. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> then I took a fair break, um, and then I've got back into it recently. Cool. And uh, the current project is an interesting one. Um, it's a, a early portable radio. There were portable radios from the 20s and 30s, yep. but they were much larger affairs um, using um, considerably larger electron tubes or valves. Yep. Um, this one went into, man into production in 1947 uh, okay. in Australia. Post-war. So Post-war, they yep. kept it in production until 1952. Wow. Um, and it uses the miniaturised, uh, well, they're actually technically called miniature valves. Yep. Uh, and uh, these ones run at, uh, uh, their filaments run at 1.5 volts. So the thing that actually heats them up yep. and gets them running is basically run off a, a small torch battery. So okay, okay. Um, however, you need more than just a torch battery. <laughs> <laughs> you need more than just the filament. You need you need a high voltage as well with these things, and um, I, th I 
hold this up to the camera, and with any luck, we can we can actually be able to zoom in and see that we have a high voltage battery there. <laughs> actually, consists of seven nine volt standard transistor batteries. That's here. yeah. <laughs> uh, there's six visible and one behind, all, okay. in, all in series, giving us sixty three volts. Okay. Okay. The uh, the specification for the original A battery, as it's called, was a single battery. Um, uh, of 67 and a half volts. Okay. But a little bit of research showed that uh, they're very tolerant of that voltage. Okay. And so rather than overdrive, we're better to run at 63. And so. So, so what batteries did they originally have in there? Was there a, there was a, a B battery in there or something? Was there? Was uh, it was called the A battery, a battery but, it, okay. but it's not nothing to do with uh, with the current series style of A, double A, and so mm. on. Right. Uh, the A battery was just the high voltage one. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, you can still buy them. There's a company in America that makes the, the batteries that originally plugged into these, but oh, wow. they're okay. very, very expensive. <laughs> okay. Um, and you take it apart and it probably looks like that? Uh, it, <laughs> it may well do without the casing, <laughs> but yes, it's probably something similar. It's probably made up of a similar sort of cell structure. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, so that's the high voltage battery. Um, on the other side, over here, under this very badly designed panel. It's supposed to be two standard D-sized batteries. There we go. However, as you can see, this metal thing here is very hard. It's got two little weird clips there. It's sitting right next to the audio <laughs> amplification tube. I would be surprised if many owners of this radio didn't smash their valves while they were trying to oh change their, their low voltage battery. Now the low voltage battery lasts much less time than the high voltage one because the tubes pull 250 milliampere. Yeah, okay. Um, and um, these these batteries, particularly when they were zinc uh, zinc carbon batteries as they were in the 40s, yep. they really didn't last very long. So you may get, you know, six months out of your A battery, but uh, you'd probably be changing these fairly frequently. Yep. So rather than use D's, I've just built a little thing of three of three alkaline double A cells in there um, because it's a good deal easier to open this and change them, <laughs> and far less risky to the tubes. Fantastic. So the radio is built on the principle of the supersonic heterodyne circuit, which is usually just abbreviated to superhet. Super. Um, and most superhets have at least five tubes. This one has only four because it doesn't require a rectifier for the power. Because it's yeah. DC already. So it's DC. Um, and the more sophisticated uh, the more sophisticated circuits usually had a radio amplification stage as well. Okay. Um, if we switch over to that um, little schematic diagram of the superhead. We'll go over to that. Another diagram. Oh, sorry. That is just below. So this is the principle on which a super heterodyne system works. You've got an aerial on the left of the screen, um, which is essentially tuned. Um, now this radio doesn't have the RF amplifier bit. Uh, right. It's got basically so going straight from from there yep. into the the valve that's called the mixer. Okay. Um, okay. And what that, what that mixer valve does is it takes a local oscillating signal um, and mixes it with the radio frequency that, yep. that comes in. It's called, it's called heterodyning the, the thing. Yep. Um, and basically out the other end of that comes a combination of the oscillator frequency yep. and the tuned radio frequency. Yep. Um, and the combination is the two frequencies added together and also the difference between the two frequencies. Yep. You also get some harmonics and things that you try to filter out yep. uh, and so forth. Filter. So the principle is that the local oscillator changes its frequency as you exactly as you change your RF um, tuning, yep. which is why the radios generally will have a dual gained variable capacitor in it. One side of the variable this capacitor is actually tuning the radio side. Yep. The other side is actually adjusting the oscillation to make sure that you've got a consistent gap or difference between the, the two signals. Fantastic. Um, in this case, the intermediate frequency, as it's called, is 455 kilohertz, which yep. is fairly standard for, for this sort of equipment. Um, so it's just below 
the 540 kilohertz point at which the band starts. Yep. Um, from there, this standardized signal, as it were, is fed into the IF amplifier. Yep. And this is where the beauty of the whole thing comes in. It, um, because the signal is essentially coming to it on the same frequency, no matter what radio station you're tuning in, yep. um, you can have a very highly tuned IF uh, amplifier, yep. because it's only got to be tuned to that one frequency, yep. essentially. Fantastic. That's where you get your selectivity on your radio. Mm. Well and truly. So it was a big advance uh, in terms of in terms of being able to really pick up bands right across the AM um, and uh, making use of a lot more frequencies. Cool. Uh, yeah. So from the IF amplifier, it goes into what's called the demodulator, which essentially rectifies the signal yep. um, and retrieves the original um, the original signal that modulated the RF, yep. and then it goes to an audio amplifier um, and out the speaker. So, Justin, if we can switch over to the actual circuit diagram for this radio, yeah. yep. you can see all these components in the circuit diagram. We've got four valves in order from left to right there. Um, the so first one is an IR5, so 1R5, the first, the first digits yep. are 1 for the actual voltage. Yep. Uh, 1R5, and that's actually the mixer. And you can see... So the antenna literally goes straight into yeah. straight into that valve. You've got C2 and a, um, yep. C2 there. Yep. Um, and then if you go down a little bit, you've got C4, which is the other side of the variable capacitor, oh, yeah. which is tuning this oscillating coil down there. So yep. the oscillation coil is just below, yep. is below there. there. And so you can see both the radio frequency and the oscillate the oscillating frequency or the, the local oscillation, LO as it's called, yep. going in there. Fantastic. And essentially what comes out the right hand side of that yep. goes through a couple of tuned coils yep. and gets fed into the IF amplifier, which is a pretty straightforward sort of thing. Um, which is a one T four. That would be right, yeah. Is that what I'm reading? Yes, I think that's right. Okay, cool. Um, and once you've got that amplified signal, it then moves through the second set of tune coils. Yep. Uh, it heads to the demodulating valve, which is the 1S something or other. Five. It's a 1S5. 1S5. Yep. Okay. Um, and uh, coupled across. From there, you can see it goes down to the volume control, which is uh, R4. Um, actually, it's going into the uh, the grid on the other side. Yeah. So just just almost directly below, and then to the left a little. Yeah, that way. Yep, that's. Oh, there's R four. Sorry, yeah, yeah that's yeah, your yeah. volume control arrangement yes. there. Okay, okay. Um, and that's f that feeds into the uh, the grid of that of the of that there. valve. Yep. Yeah. Um, and the signal is essentially demodulated. There's a couple of capacitors in there that take that, that essentially decouple things. Yep. And then it goes to what is essentially an audio. An audio amplifier. frequency amplifier. Fantastic. Um, and then to the speaker. And a matching transformer for the speaker. Well, it should match, but of course I don't have exactly the right speaker in there anymore <laughs> because one of the things I found about this radio was the speaker was completely dead and well, needed replacing. So what's the... do you know what the original impedance of that speaker was? What? Um, I do actually have the spec for it. Okay. And the little J car one I got is so close that oh, okay. I'm using the old transformer with it. Yeah. yeah and yeah. it's working beautifully. Okay. Cool. <laughs> cool I was cool. very lucky, but that was just a lucky strike, as it were, with right. at uh, at J car electronics. Okay. <laughs> it's almost perfect. Yeah. yeah. And the size was perfect as well. So. Cool. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, so this um, radio was. Let me switch back to video. And um, this radio was uh, colloquially known as a as a fridge radio, although strictly speaking there's a larger AWA model that's called the fridge. Uh, bring it around oh, here. Right. There we that's go. Right. Um, it looks very black but it's actually a, a, a sort of, it's a walnut. Chocolate, it's, chocolate brown. It's a walnut colour. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> walnut. That's much, that's much more elegant. I think that <laughs> it's officially called walnut. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it turned itself it on as soon as I open it because of the little switch. I'll just shut that up by holding it. <laughs> Um, it only has a, s a single dial in there for your frequency dial yep. um, and a volume, a volume control and, uh, and a shifter and a little uh, station logging card there. I love it. Uh, a tuned aerial inside this opening flap. So it's in, in the actual uh, cover? Yeah. In the, mm. Yeah, okay. And that's, that I assume is connected through these, it actually these hinges. Is, it actually is connected through the hinges, but it's done reasonably, reasonably yeah. well. It okay. works. Okay. Uh, so. 
I can't believe how quickly that. I call it the bar fridge because it's a little. <laughs> So, but I can't, be, I can't believe how quickly that that comes up. Yeah. When uh, you, you know the the my digital TV takes at least ten times. That's that right. To get going. <laughs> it's got to go through a boot up sequence. You know. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's um, it is. It is quite extraordinary. Um, in a very very dark room, you can see a glow from the valve. From the but filament, they, yeah. Um, but uh, it's, it doesn't seem to require very much okay. uh, to, to get them up to temperature uh, because it really kicks in much faster than, than any other valve radio I've had. Well, truly. Mm. Well, truly. Yeah. That's fantastic, Clint. Oh, and the only other thing we were going to have a quick look at was oh. um, because the, um, yes. the mixer valve, the one yes. we were talking about at first, uh, was one of the dead items inside this radio, including all its capacitors and half of its resistors. Um, I couldn't resist but pull one apart. And if we zoom, so we because I'll the, give you the, what we're looking at there. So this is called a pentagrid valve. Um, it uses, um, so the bit that you can see that's torn with my Dremel on the outside is called the plate and is basically the anode of the valve. <laughs> This bit? Yes. looked lovely before I attacked it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the only way you can see inside them. Uh, smash the glass and break, yep. <laughs> and break the plate. Uh, and then what we've got inside are in fact uh, five concentric um, grids, as they're called, or screens. Um, and so the, okay. um, the oscillating current comes in first and, um, and it operates, actually it's in the inside, it's closest to the cathode, okay. uh, which is the hot bit that's giving off the electrons. Yep. So a, a hot bit of metal in a vacuum will actually emit electrons, well. this is called the fermionic principle. And um, these are very high vacuum valves, yep. um, they don't have any of that flashing that you see on the old valves that yep. they used to use to try and get rid of the last Bit of, of bit of oxygen or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they, they were achieving really good vacuums with these yeah, with okay. these valves in the late forties. Uh, oh, it's turned itself on again. So one of the things I have to do is get a tiny spring for that for the clip. <laughs> so it's being held with tape still at present. <laughs> That's ninety nine point nine finished. <laughs> uh, so yes, the oscillator the oscillator um, frequency goes into the into the centre, and then and then you have a screen for that. Um, then you have your radio frequency feeding into the next grid, and that's also screened. Uh, and uh, and then essentially the two are mixed um, and come out at the plate. Um, so the electrons are essentially coming um, from the centre of the valve. Coming from the centre and essentially controlled by the grids yep. as they go. Yes, that's good. Slightly better. So yeah, so I mean, fantastic. Um, Edison discovered um, the this principle in uh, about the same time as uh, several other famous people too. When yeah. he was just mucking around with light globes, um, and essentially found well, if you've got one heated and you've got a heated anode, well, heated cathode and a non-heated anode, then you could get power to go one way, but it wouldn't go the other way because yeah. there was nothing to. Um, uh, the there are no electrons coming electrons. off the other way, so yeah, if you yeah. put an alternating current through this, you essentially rectified it, and it uh, was uh, that's what they first became used for. Essentially, what Rectified. we now call diodes uh, <laughs> <laughs> were basically two pin valves. <laughs> no, no, spot mm. on, spot on. Mm. Fantastic. Now um, I've got a, a bit of a question. Um, what um, um, what do? Uh, how long did it take you to get to this stage? And uh, probably a, a, a precursor question to that: What what condition was this radio in when you when you found it or bought it or or got it the first time? Um, it was it was not too bad. I'm like, well, I mean, I bought it because the case looked like it was more or less intact. Okay. Um, and uh, the inside, I really had no idea how uh, how it would look. Um, but uh, yeah. It was. It had a lot of corrosion from uh, batteries that had leaked into it. Uh, quite a few components had had died. Yep. So yeah, the actual process of of, um, of going through and replacing and acquiring all the necessary values of the components and so on, um, it probably took me a couple of weeks, um, working an hour or so after work. And and did you find that there were particular components in there that you you ended up replacing all of them, or or that that had suffered the uh, suffered the battery acid or suffered the, 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 the time that 
um, yeah. it hadn't been used and all of that sort of stuff. Well, right? the electrolytic component, the electrolytic capacitors are nearly always dried out yeah. in, in equipment that's yeah. just old. And certainly, um, you, uh, you rarely find one that's still within reasonable spec. Um, the other type of capacitor that was in this one was a thing called the AWA chocolate capacitor. Um, Sil silver mica? No. No? Not, not silver mica. Okay. Um, this, it, it does have some silver markers, there's one there, okay. and they were still okay. okay. They were fine. Okay. Okay. But there was a thing called, and I don't actually know what, what uh, compound they used, but okay. AWA made these things specially for their radios, um, and they just had a tendency to crack and just you'd lose contact altogether. Oh, okay. Um, I was reading an article in um, Silicon Chip from 2018. Yep. Um, where someone did a, a very similar restoration of this. I only found it yesterday. Oh, wow. uh, they had the same problem with the speaker I did. But, strangely enough, they didn't replace any of their capacitors. He reckoned even the large electrolytics in this one were still good. I find it hard to believe, wow. but he got it working. So, okay. there you go. Because um, the, the electrolytics were usually paper capacitors. They were, mm. and they just dry out. Yeah. That's, that's um, uh, and yeah, you find the values nowhere near where it used to be. Often, <laughs> strangely enough, a lot higher than it should be. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I found with electrolytics, they have a tendency to go up, at least for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you find it's got more capacity than what you want. <laughs> well, yeah, it probably, it probably doesn't. It probably couldn't tolerate the voltages though, so it's going to short circuit Correct. very quickly. Yes. But at low voltage, with a tester, it'll often come up much higher. Okay. You go, wow, that can't be right. Okay. Um, so yeah, but I mean, there's very, there's actually very little expense in this. Probably the most expensive component in the whole thing is the seven, uh, <laughs> the nine seven volt batteries, <laughs> nine volt batteries. Yes. <laughs> well, that's hmm. fantastic. That is excellent. Um, we've got a studio audience now with uh, Warren and uh, Ron. <laughs> so, uh, good evening, good evening. <laughs> good evening. Hey, has the studio audience got any questions for, uh, for Glenn? And we are, um, we are going out on streaming uh, right at the moment, and I am actually monitoring the chat channel. So uh, if you're uh, watching on, uh, on streaming um, and you'd like to put a question in, then feel free to. Uh, and we can we can maybe uh, maybe answer it on air or, or later. So uh, and I, I just I notice it on the inside of the back cover there is a wonderful uh, a one it's a circuit diagram, but it's also the service instructions. <laughs> so um, all about the batteries and the the A and the B batteries and uh, we'll let that one yeah. Can there. we put that on the camera? Yeah. I just. Um, And that I uh, came in a little bit late, so I, I'd, I'd like to see the uh, the, the face the mm -hmm. face of the radio. Mm -hmm. right. So it actually turns on when you open it because that's its only switch. It actually has a little oh, oh, yeah. we've got a bit of interference inside the studio, so I just put my finger on that. Yes, but, um, okay. it comes on when you open the open the lid. <laughs> that is very nice. The aerial is in the lid. Yeah. It's a loop a aerial in oh, the yes, lid. Okay. It's actually uh -huh. a tuned aerial. Yeah, yeah. Mm. nice. I love it. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, it's sometimes called the AWA fridge, but I, I prefer to call it the, <laughs> the AWA bar fridge because it's because it's much smaller than the real AWA fridge, which I think is a I think I wrote it down a four three nine MY about the same vintage. Uh -huh. But yes, they made a couple of these sort of vertical. This is actually meant to be sort of vertical orientation. Yes. But so it really doesn't look much like what we would recognise as a radio now. No. And it didn't in 1947 either. It was quite a, a quite an unusual design. That's the vintage of it, is it? 47. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh. It comes with a little picture a showing showing um, a serving suggestion there. The oh. pack, a pack of fags and some coffee. <laughs> <laughs> There's the serving suggestion. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Bank of batteries? Are they they're in series? Are they? Oh, uh, these are these are in series to give us 63 volts, uh -huh. and then we've got three double A's uh, just to give us one and a half for the filaments of the, the yep. valves, and the fourth valve is hidden right down the back there. Okay. Which is the actually the one valves. we pull apart. But okay. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Quite a chip. Hmm. And and this I'll, I'll just take that away. That's the uh, inside of the um, uh, the back uh, the back panel. Um, that has the service instructions and the circuit diagram when they actually supplied you with the circuit diagram which is quite novel uh, 
Um, and and I, I just I'll just turn it over because um, I assume you've come oh, up with these <laughs> these wonderful <laughs> stickers. Um, this is the little um, that actually tells you the model and the serial number, and also its manufacturing date, and then it's restored by an order. Had to put my name on it. Hobart. <laughs> I love it. Very good. And there's one of them on the uh, on the back. Yes, on the back here as well. That's that's better. Yeah. There we go. The other thing that I hadn't seen until I actually pulled the whole thing apart was that uh, Australian Radio Technical Services license is actually hidden under there. Because of course all that, all radios had to have a little license on them. Well, <laughs> and a whole and a whole set of patent numbers next to it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> let's go back. Great. To well, that. Uh, any any questions from our uh, our studio audience? Um, or applause? <laughs> 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 Definitely. We don't have a laugh track yet. We should no, no, track. sorry. I, I, I haven't quite Ooh. got that far in the studio that's, yet. That's an interesting <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> the laugh track and the uh, the, the and canned applause. And, applause, applause yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, and we need the uh, we need the uh, the sign with the <laughs> lights up with the applause. Yes, so uh, on air. Mm. So uh, oh, yeah. applause. Yes. So any any <laughs> it, do, it, do, it does have a so the challenge is to find um, a, oh, yes. a spring for for this device so that I can actually hold it closed properly because that's one of the bits that I wasn't able to replace is the spring inside the little catch that's uh, that's meant to hold it closed. So my tape keeps uh, going in the warm weather at the I, moment, I, and uh, I wonder if. If you can't find an actual spring, is it worth talking to a, um, a watchmaker or something like that? Yeah, I think um, it's it is almost a. It's so small it is really a watchmaking type spring that it needs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, 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 quite neat. And <laughs> but a strange sort of shape. I mean, it it sort of it sort of looks like it should be the other way up to uh, on its side. That's right. Yeah, that's that's, right. that's mm. exactly right. Um, but uh, oh, um, but as I say, the serving suggestion shows it's def and the handle shows it's definitely meant to be used the right way up. Oh, definitely, yeah, definitely. It back and it's it's yeah. and um, complete with the uh, the the strong black coffee and the and the fags. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> um, dear, oh dear. Be there. No, well, that that is fantastic, Glenn. Thank you very much for. Uh, Thank for you taking for us through that opportunity, and, and we look forward, um, we look forward to the next, uh, the next project. <laughs> I mean, you might have to mind you if it's the big, uh, the big console sort of radio. We might have to just take photos. But uh, <laughs> no, the next, the next one is actually an AWA clock radio. Oh, clock radio with a big dial in the middle of it. What sort of era? An electric what, clock. What sort of era? Nineteen fifties. Nineteen fifties. Okay. <laughs> Did they ever produce a? Um, a T, uh, um, what were they called? I don't know if AWA did. T Caddy? One of those ones that made you a cup made of tea in the morning. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Still can't get a mobile phone that'll do that. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love it. There must be an app for that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Plug in a USB well, device. You can probably get a Bluetooth sort of kettle, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, or a Bluetooth um, Bluetooth coffee maker or something like yes. that. Anyway, <laughs> that is fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you very Cheers. much. <laughs> and we we look forward to the uh, to the. Oh, now I'll was, you was there anything on here that you wanted to show? Uh, we if you can put that up, it does have a picture of the uh, inside of the catch that I'm trying to find, trying to oh, okay. uh, repair. Now that will be O three nine eight. That one. Okay. Well. Open that. Ah, okay. Now, now, what I will do is just drag that uh, across to there. Okay. That's what we're yeah. actually looking at. So I have a little attempted made spring in there as a replacement. Oh, that I see. That did yep. not work. But that gives you an idea of the scale. That really is too big. That was actually the end of a tiny little safety pin. Um, no, I can't zoom in. We really need something about three mil long <laughs> that will just push that clip back. That's the spring there. Yes. Yeah. But that's probably not what the original one looked like. 
I was just okay. an attempt. I, I had a few attempts at trying different materials to try and... And, but, and yeah. how much room is there between the top and the bottom, like when that's sandwich, when it's actually screwed to the Bakelite, um, how much room are we talking? Probably a couple of mil, no, that's a bit probably not even, probably about a mil, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. it's pretty small. Yeah, okay. So All that right. one's French. And the other two shots, um, if it's possible yeah. to switch them over, there's, uh, I think there's a, one of the original, uh, you can see some of the components that have been replaced there. Cool. So the tubes are out of it there. Yeah, um, and that, in But here. you can see the big paper capacitor oh, yes. there that I've actually replaced with two much smaller units which are just mounted underneath yep. here. Um, and then the next shot I think shows the underside um, with some of these AWA chocolate capacitors oh, in there, yeah, those yeah, ones. Yes. Okay, yes. I see what you mean. They, they've got a waxy coating on them. Yeah. 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 And they're quite, they're, they're big, they're quite large. They were quite big, so as you can see, another one there. The, yeah, there was <laughs> there's quite a few of them and they were all well out of spec. What's their typical values? Uh, about uh, 500 nanofarad and 50 nanofarad, so yeah. somewhere around those sort of those sort of. Like they're, they're huge for yeah. the value these days. Oh yeah, that's right. They're yeah. just, but of course they had very high voltage um, tolerance. Yeah. Um, and so actually finding the the right components with the high voltage, because not a lot of demand for the high voltage Correct. stuff, um, uh, can be a little tricky. But yeah, that. They're, t they're attainable and they're yep. only a dollar or so. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, I think that's probably the only thing that. Oh, that's a. Oh, that's just it on the workbench. Kind of finished it now. Cool. Which we've had a look at. Yeah. Oh, there's a bit of uh, herring bone in there. Mm. That's, uh, that's all right. Cool. Mm. Well, fantastic. No, yeah, very nice. Fantastic. Oh, well. No. Thank you, Justin. Oh, I'll leave you to the rest of your show. No, no, well, truly, <laughs> pleasure, and thank you very much. Ah, and you can you can take that with you. Thank you. So I don't forget that. Cheers. Cool. All right, um, we'll just do a quick uh, ID. This is VK7 ITC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania, with our uh, our uh, ATV experimenters night, um, and that was. Uh, uh, a bit of a blast from uh, blast from the past with AWA valve portable radio, uh, fridge radio. I love it. <laughs> um, we might um, move to um, on the uh, the uh, weekend. I was given um, I was given, and we'll just I was given this to play with. First of all, asked if I actually wanted. Wanted, return. wanted it. Um, <laughs> we we moved slightly, slightly more, uh, slightly uh, to the. Um, ah, now there we go. Um, now um, we might turn those lights back on again. Actually, um, what we've got is. Um, I think we're talking 1980, late 80s, 90s here. Um, it's a Garmin um, um, Street Pilot 3 GPS, um, supposedly portable GPS, and you can see uh, we're talking about quite a large unit here. Uh, fold down antenna, or you can pull that out and there's an external antenna. Um, um, but uh, it was meant for a car vehicles. Um, um, vehicles with uh, um, there we go street pilot oh, I don't think we can see let me turn that off street pilot uh, 3 um, ok searching for satellites um, so it, it had uh, it, it was your your um, what is almost stock standard these days in cars <laughs> almost stock standard not quite um, it came uh, came with a, uh, a mount and uh, uh, a way to charge the battery um, through your uh, um, through your uh, cigarette lighter um, it does um, 13, 4 satellite. 
<laughs> it does have a voice, so uh, it is of an era. And uh, quite uh, interestingly, um, the um, where you plugged into the uh, the, the uh, battery, the, the cigarette lighter here, um, it actually had the speaker where you plugged into the 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 cigarette lighter. Um, so the speaker was, uh, and you can you can hear it here. I'll, I'll hold it next to the speaker. Thirteen four satellites. <laughs> so uh, you you unfortunately can't uh, can't uh, select a particular different voice. Uh, so a, a slightly more salubrious voice, or uh, or Darth Vader, or somebody else. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, it, it has a a range of um, uh, it came with a range of maps that you could update. Um, it came with, and the, this is an interesting little exercise, in the back here there is a, a cover um, a cover that opens up into a, um, a little, literally a little container that I assume contains an E-squared ROM, totally proprietary. <laughs> Um, and this is the one for the Australian City Navigator Data Card version 4. Um, goes in, it actually locks in, and there's a little um, uh, dust, dust um, and weather cover that goes on top. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, and you can set it up, you can uh, trace, uh, you, can, it, it, you can get it to do route calculations and all the stuff that you'd expect with a, um, with a GPS these days. Um, I was led to believe when it was bought new it was about six hundred dollars um, so six hundred dollars we're talking in you know the late 80s 90s um, so it's a fair bit of money fair bit uh, um, and, and maybe a little bit later than that I haven't quite got to the bottom of when uh, when it was released but there's certainly on the Garmin site all the information about it and the manuals and all of that sort of stuff so um, anyway I intend to do a little bit of playing with it um, and uh, uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see um, see how it goes. It does come with a, a little, <laughs> quite a cute little dash mount, um, and the, these are filled with quite heavy material. I don't know whether it's lead or it's something, but it's quite heavy material, so that you would sit it on the dash and it would actually mould itself to the dash, so that it wouldn't move. Um, and there's a little cradle that it. It clicks into, um, and you can you can uh, adjust the um, uh, the the angle um, that you're looking at the screen and all of this sort of stuff. So uh, so yeah, that's a little <laughs> a little intrigue. Um, a Garmin Street Pilot Three um, um, that uh, uh, I'll uh, I'll be playing with for a uh, for a little while. So uh, <laughs> anyway, now um, we. Um, We've had a bit of a fanfare, and I've got a couple of videos um, tonight that relate to this. There was a bit of a fanfare just recently at the Tokyo Ham Fest, um, which was um, um, the fanfare from ICOM about their IC705. And the ICOM705 is touted to be the, the FT817818 killer. Because it it's a it is follows in the in the wake of the seventy three hundred and the ninety seven hundred. Um, it is an SDR radio, um, but it is a portable radio. Um, so about actually it's about the size it's about the size of that AWA from what I can see. That's that's the sort of physical size of it. Um, but it has a built-in battery and a few other things, and it is an SDR radio. Uh, for um, I don't know what it covers, whether it covers HF and VHF and UHF like the um, the 817. But uh, but there is um, I've included a video at the end of this. There was a bit of a fanfare of videos um, when ICOM released it at the Tokyo Ham Fest. But um, there was one that was released about a month ago by a guy who is a survival specialist. Um, and he's touting it as a as a radio, certainly as the the next 818. Um, but he he talks about the the radio in a survival sense. So I pick that up and I'll, I'll, I'll f play that at the um, at the end. But 
the thing that happened at Dayton 2019, which I, I haven't read that much about, but I, I was watching a video the other night that had an interview with a guy at a ham fest in the UK, and he was talking about um, the Elecraft K4. And I went, hmm, haven't heard about the K4, certainly heard about the KX2 and the KX3. And the KX3 I'm looking at right at the moment is a potential purchase. Um, <laughs> so, so um, but in the background was this big advertising um, placard for the KX4. And I sort of went, hmm, okay, need to look into this. So I looked into it and I've included a video and it's the first video tonight, which is uh, a bit of an interview with the uh, the guy at the Elecraft scan stand at Dayton uh, talking about the um, the K4 and the release of the K4 and its bells and whistles and all of that sort of stuff. So, so is it K4 or KX4? K4. Okay. It's just K4. So and it's it's certainly not a portable rig. This is a base sort of station mm -hmm. rig. Um, uh, but a K, a K4 and it is a direct up and direct down conversion SDR radio, full SDR radio. So, um, so yeah, I, I've included a, um, uh, a video about that. That's our first video tonight. So, uh, uh, but I, I just thought th there wasn't much fanfare about the K4. Like it wasn't like the, the IC705 when it came out, there was just this flurry of videos put out. Um, a, a about the IC705 and all of this sort of stuff, but the K4, uh, bit of a low key, uh, low key sort of uh, um, uh, 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 release of the, the radio. So anyway, um, now um, on the weekend, I just remind people, uh, certainly in uh, VK7 who may be watching this video, um, we have released the uh, VK7 broadcast roster for 2020. Uh, and there are still a few gaps in it uh, in the HF uh, rebroadcasting bands. So if you're uh, if you're capable of uh, rebroadcasting on a Sunday morning, and I put a call out to those people who sit there and listen to uh, the broadcast on their uh, on their radios on a Saturday on a Sunday morning, uh, and they have a HF radio that's there as well, uh, we can supply you with a patch box if you need a patch box. Um, and uh, you, all you need to do is basically go out um, on the, the frequency for the, the WIA broadcast and the VK7 broadcast on the relevant HF frequency and then take callbacks at the end. So uh, if you're interested in giving us a hand to fill some of those holes in the roster, uh, all of those other rebroadcasters and myself will be greatly appreciative. <laughs> so I'll put the call out there. And just a reminder, um, the WIA has put out uh, just recently the future of amateur radio. Um, there are a range of um, uh, issues facing the hobby, um, and what the uh, the WIA has done with the ACMA is set up um, a a mechanism that enables them to put those issues out for uh, suggestions, for feedback, um, for um, for for a a path that we can gather that feedback and then feed it back to the ACMA. Um, and so it's called the Future of Amateur Radio Program. If you're a WIA member, you automatically become a, a member of this forum um, and you get all of the updates and all of that sort of thing. Um, if you're not, you can, uh, and it's open to uh, WIA members, it's open to non-WIA members, it is just basically open to the amateur community and we want to get as many people as we can involved uh, with uh, determining what the future of amateur radio looks like. And the very first issue that's going to be put up there as a paper and a bit of a survey is around the foundation license call signs and shortening them back to uh, a call sign that uh, doesn't have any problems with digital modes. So um, that's one of the first polls and the first information papers that's going out. But um, if you want to have a say, um, you need to uh, you need to actually uh, get onto the Future of Amateur Radio uh, site and uh, log that you actually want to be involved. So uh, encourage everybody to be involved. Um, now uh, the big news, big big news. Um, 
We're having the, um, you, you probably know, we're having the uh, WIA annual conference here in Hobart in 2020 uh, on the May the 8th to the 10th uh, on that weekend. Uh, now the event site is up and going uh, and taking registrations right at the moment. We've got quite a few registrations already uh, and only been open a week. Um, there is, I just wanted to remind people that um, there is, we've organised with the Spirit of Tasmania for uh, for our mainline, mainland um, watches. Um, we've organised a discounted rate for accommodation and the fair on the Spirit of Tasmania for the two weeks before and the two weeks after, the 8th to the 10th of May. Uh, and what we have also done, and this has only just come through, is organised permission from the ship's masters, um, and there's multiple, uh, there's obviously two ships, um, but the ship's masters to operate handheld amateur radios on 6, 2 and 70 centimetres on the Spirit of Tasmania when you travel on the Spirit of Tasmania. So you're not normally able to do that. Um, they don't give permission out lightly. Um, and so um, for those uh, for those that month of the um, the the touring throwing of the spirit uh, with the the, the um, weekend conference weekend in the middle, you can actually operate your handheld six two and seventy centimeter radio on the ship, and basically operate maritime mobile. So uh, so yeah, that's uh, um, we've got that that permission. Um, there's some there are some some small conditions around doing that. Um, which are available on the WIA website, but they're, they're certainly not restrictive at all. So, uh, and the other thing is, um, if you're coming to Tasmania and you need accommodation, we've organised discounted accommodation at the Best Western Hotel, which is the venue for the conference. Um, and the, uh, the Best Western discount is $149 uh, a night rooms. Um, and they're, 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 that's their normal rooms, which they're discounted to 149 bucks a night. So that's pretty, uh, that's pretty good if you have a look at uh, what's available. Um, and you can call them up, uh, quote WIA conference, and they will give you the discount. So uh, there you go. Um, so um, we'll head into our videos. Um, now our videos, as I mentioned, the Elecraft K4, um, a new look at the ICOM IC705. Now, no, um, no amateur radio program uh, up in very close to Christmas um, would be complete without playing a ham's night before Christmas. <laughs> so we've got that as well as a video. Um, we've got, if ham radio suppliers made more selling videos, so that was a pretty interesting one. Um, and we go into, um, and I don't think we're gonna get through this all, but um, there was a fascinating documentary I think it was made in the 1970s, but a fascinating uh, documentary about the the discovery of the transistor by Shockley and um, his his team at Bell Labs. So uh, that was that, it, so that's on there. And um, if we do get through that, and I'm not sure we will, but we then go on to quantum computing and a, a simplified explanation of quantum computing. <laughs> so. Um, we are on uh, streaming and if you want to uh, throw a chat uh, anything on the chat channel you're welcome to and I'll just uh, I'll, in a moment I'll take a bit of a listen on R2 um, and see whether there is uh, any callbacks on R2 um, um, but I wish everybody uh, season's greetings and we are looking at having a uh, potentially having a, a DATV night uh, on Christmas night um, for those people who want to um, maybe get away from their family a little bit um, and come up here and play radios on their new radio that they found under the tree. Uh, you're quite welcome to. Uh, so we're having a little bit of a Christmas night, uh, maybe uh, get together, uh, maybe have barbecue or something. No, maybe not, because everyone will be stuffed from lunch. But anyway, <laughs> so um, so we are thinking, so uh, take a keep a bit of an eye on Facebook um, to see whether it's there or not. Um, uh, I'll go out and see what the general consensus is behind me uh, in the club rooms and we'll see how we go. But uh, anyway, season's greetings to everyone and uh, we'll catch you, uh, if not on Christmas night, we'll catch you in uh, in the uh, the new year. So uh, this is VK7 OTC, the club station of the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania with our ATV Experimenters Night. Mm -hmm.
All right, once again, Hamlet.